quickly and see if there's any questions. So what we have so far in here is three classes, our unit test class, our pizza class, and our order class. Pizza class, we have not changed for a while, near as I recall. <coughs> we have a set of attributes that are in it. We have a size, a crust, and whether or not it has pepperoni. We then have a series of constructors, the thought being that certain things uh, can be supplied when we create the class um, or when we create the object. And certain things, if they are omitted, will be defaulted. So that's the whole purpose of having three different constructors. We can supply what we have, and we can default stuff if it's not supplied. So we have one that sets all three attributes, one that only sets the size and the crust, and finally one that only sets the size and defaults the other two to those values. We don't have a no argument constructor, all right? Which means that when we create a pizza, we have to call one of these three constructors. We are not allowed to say pizza p0 equals new pizza. We may have done that in earlier examples, but that's because we had defined no constructors. So that get for free, no argument constructor is only supplied if you have not defined any other constructors. Yes? Well, if you deleted the other const, if you de went and deleted, well, I don't think I know what we're, you know. okay, let's let's go over this. Let's go over this point first, and then we'll go back and address yours. Okay, so let me save this, and let me go and try and compile this.
So it gives me an error on this. Let's make sure we understand why it gave me an error on that. It gave me an error on that because this no argument constructor is only given to you if you specify no other constructors. So in this example, I have three other constructors. I have a constructor that accepts three arguments, a constructor that accepts two arguments, a constructor that accepts one argument. So I don't get that no argument constructor automatically. Therefore, if I try to call that no argument constructor, I'm going to get an error. It's telling me that here's the only, here's the three constructors that I have. I have to give one of these three options. And I can't supply the no argument constructor. I can supply a constructor that accepts two strings and a Boolean, two strings, or one string. Those are my only three options. The no argument constructor is no longer an option because I've defined other constructors. So you can only use the no argument constructor if either you've supplied no constructors or if you hand write your own no argument constructor. Okay? Um, and I could do that. I could create a constructor that accepted no arguments and default all three of those properties if I wanted to. But that's why that gives me an error, because I don't automatically get the no argument constructor, and therefore I can't call the no argument constructor. Now, if I'm trying to understand what you're suggesting, you said you went in to the pizza and deleted these two constructors. OK. So why does that not work? Well. Let's save it and compile it and see the error that we get. We get errors. Why? Because we are calling the constructor that has two arguments, the constructor that has one argument. But we've just deleted them. Well, yeah, in other words, we define the constructor in the pizza class. Here is where we call the constructor by saying new pizza. So in other words, if I say pizza, new pizza, S, thick, there has to be a constructor in the pizza class that has, that has two strings. All right? Because this is trying to call a constructor in this class, and the only constructor in this class has two strings and a boolean. Repeat that. What do you mean all of those and one? It has nothing to do with P1 or anything like that. It's like when I call a constructor, whatever arguments I give in the constructor, forget about what this is called, where I say new pizza and I have something like this. There has to be a constructor in the pizza class that has that number and type of arguments. So in, in uh, where I'm calling it and I'm creating the pizza, I'm supplying two arguments. There has to be a constructor in the pizza class that accepts two arguments, both of them being string. There, ha there can be others as well, but yes, there has to be a constructor that only accepts two arguments. What do you say when you're saying if this has, if that has? Okay. Remember, here we're defining the constructors. We're saying what constructors are available, how we can make a pizza. All right? A constructor is how we make an object of this class. So right now, we only have one constructor that we can use to make a pizza. That's the only one that's available to us. Here is where we're calling the constructor. You have to distinguish between defining the constructor over here and calling the constructor. When we call the constructor, we have to call a constructor that exists. 
this constructor that we're calling has two arguments, both string. There is no constructor that has two arguments, only strings. String, string. Here's a string, string boolean, but there is no constructor that only has two strings. Therefore, we get an error when we try to compile it. If I put these back, whoops. If I put these back, now there is a constructor that only has two arguments. And therefore, we can call the constructor that only has two arguments. And we can do that without getting an error. We create multiple constructors because other people that use our class may have some or all of those fields and therefore, we want to give options to how we can create that class. We want to give the ability to just default some fields if we want to, uh, if, if whoever's using the class wants to. All right? So therefore, I defined three ways of creating a pizza object, three constructors, which means that any time we go and we call a pizza constructor, we have to match the number and type of arguments that are defined in one of these three. In addition, the no argument constructor no longer exists because we've defined other constructors and we haven't defined the no argument constructor. Okay. Other than that, we have kind of standard stuff going on here. We have our attributes. We have our get and set methods. Remember, those get and set methods are necessary because we're making these attributes private, which means that other classes can't directly access them. Other classes have to go through the methods to access them. So to set the value of the size, we have to use a set method. To get the value of the size, we have to use the get method. Any class outside of this, we have to use the get and set method. And then we have a couple other methods that do calculations. Calculate the bake time, which depends on the kind of crust it has. Calculate the price, which depends on the size. And whether it's thick crust or not, and whether it has pepperoni or not. Questions about this class? The newest thing that we encountered in this example is an array list. All right? Because an order, all right, we don't know how many pizzas are going to be on that order. There could be one pizza on the order, there could be 10. A limitation with arrays in Java is that when we define an array, we have to define it as a certain size. And then we can't make it any bigger. And that creates problems because we don't know. What if someone changes their mind and asks to get rid of a pizza from their order? Oh, I don't want that second pizza that I mentioned. Or what if someone at the last minute says, oh, I want to add a fourth pizza to, to my order or whatever? We want something that's flexible. And therefore, we use an array list of pizzas. This syntax defines an array list that's going to contain pizzas. That's what that means. Array lists contain a list of objects. And that, obje the, that list of objects is dynamic. It can change. We can start off with no items in it. We can add two items. We can add a third item. We can delete an item. We can do whatever we want to. We can make it bigger or smaller, and it will respond to it. Because of this, in the sort of triangle brackets, this array list can only hold pizzas in it. Can't put anything else in here but pizza objects. And the name of our list is called pizzas. And we create that. Remember, there's two steps necessary to creating an object reference. We declare the object reference variable, and then we actually create the object. So this creates a variable called pizzas 
that's going to be an array list that contains pizza objects. And we create that array list by doing this. Now there's only one constructor on order. One that accepts a string for the name of the person on the order and another string for the phone number. That corresponds to the two attributes in the order. All right? And we're not going to default any of them because it doesn't make sense to default something. What is the default phone number? What is the default name? Those questions don't make any sense, right? So there aren't any defaults for name or phone number. Or it might make sense to say, well, on a pizza, the default is no pepperoni. On a pizza, the default is thin crust. <coughs> so we default some of the attributes uh, in that class. So this is our constructor. We have a set name and get name for the attributes, a set phone and get phone. We then have a method to add a pizza to the order. And adding a pizza to the order is simply adding it to this array list. How do you add to an array list? You have the name of the list, dot add, and the object that you want to add to it. Now that object, of course, has to be a pizza, because that's what this array list contains. It's this array list contains pizzas and only pizzas. We then have a couple of methods of calculation. They both basically work the same with a little bit of difference between the two. The calculate bake time loops through all the pizzas and sees which pizza has the highest bake time. <coughs> the assumption is, is if we get an order for a pizza, that we can bake all the pizzas at the same time, and our total bake time is going to be the bake time of the longest pizza. All right? So we set our bake time equal to zero. We loop through the array list of pizzas. We set i zero. We do this as long as i is less than the size of the array. The size of the array being however many pizzas there are in the list. We grab pizza on the list. And we look to see if its bake time is greater than the highest bake time so far. If it is, we save that bake time and then go on to the next pizza. And loop through all the pizzas, when we're done, the highest bake time is going to be in this variable, and we return it. The logic to calculate the price is very similar. The only difference is, is instead of looking for the highest price, the total price of the order is simply the sum of the price of all the pizzas. So we declare the price is zero. We do the same thing. We loop through all the pizzas in the array. We set i equal to zero. We do this as long as i is less than the number of pizzas on the list. We grab the next pizza. We get its price. and we add that price to the running total. Add the price of this next pizza, next pizza on the list, to the running total. When we are done, we have summed up all of the pizzas on the order, and that's our price. The test case. I created a couple pizzas here. I tested out their values. I created an order. I've given it two values. Why two values? Because that is a constructor that we've defined. It's a constructor that accepts two values, a name and a phone number. We add order this pizza object and that pizza object. And then we can ask for the cost of the order and the bake time of the order. So let's verify that this is correct. OK. 
the first pizza. Bake time is 16 minutes. The price is $9. Second one, the bake time is 10 minutes, and the price is $12. So, since we can bake them both at the same time, the bake time for this order is 16 minutes. That's the longer of the two bake times. And that's what this says, 16 minutes for the bake time. The cost of the order is $21, which is the sum of $9 and $12. That's $21. Questions about this? All right. Our next topic that we're going to talk about is inheritance. And some of us may have heard the, the term inheritance before. All right? That isn't required for Lab 5 yet. Okay? I just wanted to get a little bit of time going over inheritance before we have a lab exercise to make sure that you understand it. We probably have all seen, like in a biology class or something like that, uh, what's called a taxonomy of animals or living things. I'm going to put it in Word because the light is shining on that. In other words, if we were going to create an outline that showed all the living things in the world, we might start out with the top level of our outline, living things. There's certain characteristics that all living things have in common, right? All living things have in common. We then have plants and animals. Now, plants and animals are both living things, right? Anything we could say about a living thing, we can also say about a plant and an animal. All right? Under animals, we could do the same thing under plants if we wanted to. But under animals, there are certain kinds of animals. There's birds, fish, reptiles, amphibians. mammals, any other kind of living things, any other kind of animals? Marsupials, I think, are, are kinds of mammals. Ah, very good. We actually missed sort of a level. Because there's invertebrates, not sure how you spell it, and there's vertebrates. Underneath invertebrates might be insects, whereas underneath vertebrates might be birds, fish, and so on. Reptiles and mammals and amphibians. 
I'm not going to go down and do all of this, mainly because I don't know all of this, right? But we can do enough to represent and get the idea across. Underneath mammals, there are bears. Polar bears, grizzly bears, brown bears. Underneath mammals, there are dogs, poodles, great danes, and so on. Notice what we're doing. <clears throat> we're going from very general to more and more and more specific. All right? If we look at any level in this, in this diagram, and if you can imagine, we could add a whole bunch more stuff to this diagram. Anything here has all the characteristics of the levels above it. So, there are characteristics that all dogs share, all right? I'm not a biologist, so I can't tell you what they are, but, you know, bark, wag their tail. I don't know. We could come up with some. But poodles are dogs, so they share those characteristics. Now, dogs are mammals, so they share all the characteristics that mammals have. Mammals are vertebrates, so everything underneath vertebrates shares all the characteristics that vertebrates have. And finally, vertebrates are animals, and animals are living things. So a poodle is a dog, is a mammal, is a vertebrate, is an animal, and is a living thing. So it has elements of all those classes in it. All right? Has as characteristics from all those different levels in it. Now the most specific description of it is poodle, right? But a poodle is also a dog. So anything we can say about a dog, we can say about a poodle. Anything we can say about a mammal, we can say about any mammal. We can say about any dog, and we can say about any poodle. And that's true all the way up. This is what's called inheritance. All right. When you have an example of classes that are related, because one class is sort of a more specific version of another class. A poodle is just a more specific kind of dog, right? A dog's a general term. A poodle is a specific kind of dog, all right? <coughs> An animal is a general term. A mammal is a more specific kind of animal. A dog is a more specific kind of mammal, and a poodle is still more of a specific kind of dog. So we run the range as with these things. We have more general classes, and then we have more specific classes. More specific classes get everything that's in the parent class, plus it has some extra things. All right? For example, uh, mammals, they have live birth. All right? Uh, and mammals uh, have hair, all right, or fur. So because of that, if I say an animal is a mammal, I know that it gives live birth and it has hair. So anything that's defined underneath mammal has those characteristics. All right. Plus, 
it has some characteristics of its own for the more specific version of the class it is. Now, in object-oriented programming terminology, the more general things are called superclasses, and the more specific are called subclasses. All right? And something can be both a superclass and a subclass. Take, for example, mammal. A mammal is a subclass of vertebrate, which is a subclass of animal, which is a subclass of living thing. But a mammal is also a superclass for bears, whether they be polar, grizzly, or brown, dogs, poodles, Great Danes, and so on. How do you tell if one class is a subclass of another class? All right. So we have superclass is more general. A subclass is more specific. Again, this is sometimes called inheritance, it's sometimes called specification because the subclass is a specific version of the superclass. How do I know if a subclass truly is a subclass of a superclass? You perform what's called the ISA test. All right? Is a test. So, A poodle is a dog. Is that a true statement? Yes. Poodles are dogs. All right? Therefore, poodle can be a subclass of dog. All right? Part-time employee is an employee. Is that a true statement? Yes. Then part-time employee is a superclass, or I'm sorry, the subclass, and employee is the superclass. How about an engine is a car? Is that a true statement? No. An engine is part of a car, but an engine is not a car. Another way sometimes you can phrase the is a test is say is a kind of. And that still doesn't make sense. An engine is not kind of a car. A poodle is a kind of dog, or a poodle is a dog, but an engine is not kind of a, a, a car. Therefore, you would not say that uh, an engine is a subclass of car. All right? Does that make sense? Okay. So that's how you can tell if you have two objects that are related by inheritance. Now, inheritance are only one of the ways that we uh, can relate objects together. We related orders and pizzas together, all right? Is there inheritance there between orders and pizza? Is an order a pizza? Is a pizza an order? No. Therefore, there is no inheritance between order and pizza. An order isn't a kind of pizza. A pizza is not a kind of order. 
a order contains pizza. And that is another kind of way that classes can be related together. Not inheritance, but I think that's, that's pretty much pretty sure that's called composition, where one class contains another class. A engine and a car would be like that. An engine is not a car. A car is not an engine. However, a car contains an engine. So if we were developing a application for automobiles, within our automobile class, we might have an engine object because a automobile contains an engine. All right? Now, gasoline engine, what if we had this situation? Gasoline engine. electric engine, hybrid engine, what kind of inheritance situation might we have here? Yeah. There are all three subclasses of what? Exactly. Because a gasoline engine is not an electric engine. An electric engine is not a gasoline engine. A hybrid engine is not an electric engine, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. However, all of these are kinds of engines. Therefore, we could have a superclass of engine, and underneath that have three subclasses, gasoline, electric, and hybrid. OK? So we perform the ISA test to determine inheritance. We've got to look at it in both directions, right? Um, and if it passes the ISA test, it's a candidate for inheritance. All right. Let's say, for example, that we have Get, going back to our pizza example, right now, pizza class and an order class. What if I brought into the picture, and we said the order class is sort of just implied for pick up or eat in. What if we had a delivery order class? How would that fit into the picture here? Would that be a subclass of any of those two classes? Would it be a superclass of any of those two classes? A delivery order is a kind of order. Therefore, delivery order is a subclass of order. OK. So what does it mean when we say a class is a subclass <coughs> of another class? Well, first of all, it means you get everything in that superclass for free. So let's look at this order class. All right. What's the differences between, let's think of some of the differences between a delivery order and a pickup order, all right, which is sort of our default order, the pickup order. Will a regular order, I'm sorry, will a delivery order still have a name? Sure. Will it still have a phone number? Sure. Will it still have a list of pizzas that are, that are, that are uh, on the order? Absolutely. 
So what are some of the things that might be different for a delivery order? All right, it'll have an address. All right, so it'll have an address, city, state, and zip. Uh, pardon me? Maybe an apartment number, maybe a second address line. Yes? Yeah, there might be uh, a delivery time, right? Uh, right now we're calculating the bake time because, like, if we say, hey, your pizza will be ready in 16 minutes, you can be there. Whereas the time to deliver the pizza is going to be the bake time plus a certain amount of time, right? So if it gets done in 16 minutes, it's not going to get delivered to you in 16 minutes, all right? The other thing is the cost might be different. Right? They may charge $5 for a delivery charge. But pretty much everything else is going to be identical. So if we were to look at this, when we create a subclass, everything in the superclass, with one exception, everything in the superclass, the subclass gets for free. All right? And then you put in what's different in the subclass. You put the additional attributes that are in the subclass. You put in the additional methods. And you might override methods. In other words, yes, you calculate the price of a delivery order just like you calculate the price of a regular order. But there's a different method for calculating that. So therefore, we're going to override the method. All right? Let's start to define a subclass. I don't know if we'll get through the whole thing today uh, or not. The one thing, by the way, that you don't get are the constructors. All right, so constructors don't inherit. So I don't get the constructor on the regular order class. I have to make my own constructor. So let's start out Finding the delivery order class. All right. The way that I tell it's a subclass is I say extends the class that is the superclass. So subclass, that's a subclass, the word extends, and a superclass. So order is a superclass, delivery order is a subclass. Now, as I said before, I only have to put in the stuff that's different. So I don't need to put in the name, the phone, and the array list. I just have to make a tiny little tweak. I have to change this from private to protected. What does protected mean? It's sort of like private, but it means that it's available in this class, any of the subclasses. So typically, apps we create in a superclass will be protected instead of private. I don't have to go and redefine those over here, right? By virtue of me saying that this extends order, these attributes are available in the subclass as well. So I don't have to go in and put them in again. Likewise, I don't have to put any of these methods in. Set name, get name, set phone, get phone, add pizza, bake time, and so on. I only need to put in what's different. So what's different about a delivery 
order, what we said before, a delivery order is going to have an address. So I'm going to say protected string address. I'll just put one line for an address. I'm going to create a constructor here that's going to initialize these fields. So, I'm going to put in So here's my constructor. Now, a rule is that before a subclass is created, you have to create the superclass. That is, you have to call a constructor on the superclass. OK? So how are we going to do that? We need to call the constructor on the superclass. There's sort of a shorthand for that. And that's simply the word super followed by the arguments. If you remember. Our superclass has a constructor that accepts a name and a phone. So we're going to take the name and the phone from this constructor and pass it right up to the superclass's constructor. So when we call this constructor, the first thing that happens is this constructor gets called and creates the order part of the order class. It's like you can't and make a specialized version of an order until you've created the order first. So first you create the order, then you create the delivery order. And then we're going to have the other attributes set. So, we're going to have to leave off here, all right? But the rest of the class is actually pretty simple to make, all right? We just need a few gets and sets, and we need to override any function that is different in the superclass, I'm sorry, on the subclass than in the superclass. So, we'll pick up on this and we'll review it and complete the example on Wednesday. All right, that's all I had. We'll see you up in lab.